Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Camille Fairborn from Utah State University, and I'd like to welcome you to today's CauseWeb Teaching and Learning webinar. Today's guest speakers are Nathan Tintel from Dort College, Julie Clark from Hollins University, Lacey Eccles from Butler University, Dave Klanderman from Trinity Christian College, and Laura Schultz from Rowan University. Their topic today will be reflections on making the switch to a simulation-based inference curriculum, and Nathan will be leading this as a panel discussion. The way these webinars work is that all listeners are muted, and during the webinar you can ask questions by typing them into the question box, and we'll be sure to ask those questions towards the end of the webinar. And if you have any technical questions or problems with the webinar, please use the chat window for those, and we'll be happy to help you uh, during the webinar if you have any questions. So at this point, I'll turn things over to Nathan Tintel. Nathan, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, this is Nathan. Thanks to all of you for uh, listening in and participating today. I'm really excited about our topic for today, to have the chance to hear from uh, a handful of folks who have been uh, doing simulation-based inference in their classrooms uh, and for their perspective on making that switch over the last couple of years. So um, just a couple of sort of uh, structure things. So when we say simulation-based inference, what we're talking about are methods of teaching introductory statistics that have been gaining some recent popularity covering simulation, bootstrapping, and permutation tests. I think some of that recent uh, excitement and um, momentum behind using these methods and teaching introductory statistics have to do with the fact that we have readily accessible technology um, that's sort of changed over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, the fact that these methods are really conducive to an active learning pedagogy, and also some preliminary evidence that uh, these methods seem to improve student learning. The structure for what we're going to do today is we have four panelists in a minute. I'll have them introduce themselves, and uh, then I'm going to ask them five questions um, about their switching experiences, and they'll each give sort of a brief response, and then at the end I'll have a few sort of concluding remarks about some continued reading and learning you can do and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Before we get started, I am going to just see if we have Lacey Eccles audio. Lacey, are you able to speak at this point that we can hear you? All right, we're still having trouble with the audio with one of our panelists, so what we'll do is uh, if, if she happens to sort of uh, jump on, I'll give her that opportunity a couple times uh, as we're going here. Uh, she can jump in, otherwise we'll just sort of stick with the other three panelists for now, and uh, perhaps Lacey can join us during the Q&A. Um, but why don't we just uh, get started then uh, with some introductions. Julie. Uh, I teach at a small liberal arts school, Hollins University. It's in southwest Virginia, and it's a women's college. Um, I've been teaching statistics since I was in graduate school, which is, uh, I hate to say, about 30 years ago. I'm lucky enough to teach in a computer lab. Um, this course I usually teach uh, once, once each semester, and there are 15 to 20 students per class. Um, and I'm the only statistics instructor in the math department, so I can pretty much do anything I want, which is kind of nice. All right. Super. Thanks, Julie. Dave. And like Julie, I also teach at a small liberal arts college, this one in the Chicago area. Uh, we have nine different majors that require intro stats, and so we teach a number of sections each semester. I teach a lot of them. Unlike Julie, I don't teach in a computerized classroom environment, but rather my students bring their technology, be it a smartphone, laptop, or a tablet, to the classroom environment. Right. Wonderful. Thanks, Dave. And Lacey, do we have you on? I'll give a brief introduction for Lacey. I'm sure she could do much better herself, but I know Lacey's at Butler University, and uh, she joined one of our workshops uh, a few years ago that we had and has been using uh, simulation-based inference for the last couple of years. And I know she's teaching, uh, I think, uh, four different sections of introductory statistics uh, this semester. Laura? Hi, I'm Laura. I teach at Rowan University in New Jersey. This is a state university medium size. Um, we teach many sections of STAT 1 each semester. I'm teaching the honors section using simulation-based inference. I have nine students this semester only. Uh, we don't have a computer lab, so they bring tablets and computers. Um, and this is my second time teaching with this curriculum. 
All right, Laura, thank you. All right, and now that we've heard a little bit about where our panelists are from, we'll start with the first question of the day, and that is, what made you switch? Dave, you want to start us off? Sure. I attended a workshop, as is noted, in 2013. All the offices of the text were there. It was intense for about a week. Came in a little bit skeptical. Uh, when I left, I said, wow, we really want to try this. And at least one of the authors said, well, you can try just one small piece, or you can kind of jump in with both feet. I decided on the latter, ladder, although I initially had to do a semester with my old textbook. It was already committed, so I transitioned mid-year, and I was able to compare and contrast fall to spring. Super. Thanks, Dave. And just, just as a quick sort of point of reference, Dave's referring to the Introduction to Statistical Investigations uh, textbook uh, that myself and uh, Beth Chance and Alan Ross and George Cobb, uh, Soma Roy, Todd Swanson, Jill Vanderstoep uh, worked on. All right, uh, we'll, we'll skip over uh, Lacey for now and just go right to Laura. Um, yeah, so I decided to make the switch. I've been thinking about it for a long time because I'm very interested in inference based on simulation. Um, the opportunity came about to teach an honors section. So there I only had to satisfy the honors board to make this curricular change. Um, and the honors curriculum is all about student-based learning. So it was a really good fit. Um, you know, having activities at the center of every class is good. Uh, I would like to see all of our other sections switch, but we have a lot of client disciplines and a lot of faculty setting their ways, so um, that's a future goal to switch everyone over. Super. Thanks, Laura. And uh, now to Julie. Uh, I was already using an active learning approach in my introductory class. I was using the Rossman Chance workshop statistics materials, and I was pleased with those, but I was a little um, concerned by how late they got to inference. And so I went to a conference and s heard about this approach, and then um, I attended a workshop like Dave, and I was intrigued and, and uh, also jumped in head first um, and have not regretted it for a moment. All right. Super. Thanks. Um, so now that we've heard a little bit about why the switch, let's let's hear from the panelists about what they've enjoyed most, and uh, we'll start with Laura. Um, what I really like is being able to begin on day one with inferential statistics. I think it's great incorporating all the descriptive statistics on an as-needed basis. Um, this way we know uh, that we don't miss getting to the inference, which sadly happens often, especially when there's a lot of snow days. Um, also, I, I really enjoy the fact that the deeper concepts, the students really get a much better understanding, in particular the sampling distribution. Um, they don't have any problems with that, whereas in a traditional course, that's a huge stumbling block for many students to understand that concept. Super. Thanks, Laura. And we'll go on to Julie. <laughs> I'm going to repeat what Laura said. I think starting with inference concepts is fantastic, and because you can start early, they, they learn it really well, and I like um, being able to introduce those concepts through the applets so that they don't get bogged down in calculations. But we do see the calculations when we get to theory-based approaches for the same thing, so they can do as much of that as they want, but they really do understand the concepts by the end of the course. Wonderful. Thanks, Julie. And uh, we'll go on to Dave. Uh, picking up on what both Laura and Julie mentioned, I also appreciate the getting to inference early and the fact that uh, theory-based approaches are also available. This was a big selling point to my client disciplines because we use it for all of our sections of intro stats. I also like the fact that students can bring their own technology to the classroom. This seems to work wonderfully well, and we do the explorations uh, actively during each class. Super, thank you. All right, we'll <clears throat> move on to our next question. I'll let the panelists know that um, because we've been, because Lacey hasn't been sort of answering these, we're running a little bit ahead, so feel free to take a little bit more time to elaborate on your responses as you wish as we move forward uh, in the last few questions. Um, what were some of the challenges in making this switch? Lauren, you want to start? Um. Well, my biggest challenge has been with the technology. Um, hopefully it'll be a new new leaf this semester, but my university, the Wi-Fi network 
tends to crash and burn <laughs> all the time. So it's a problem when you're relying on the internet to run these applets during class. I don't teach in a computer lab, so the students, they bring tablets and phones and computers, so it's a problem when the network goes down. So then suddenly they can't do it. Um, I do use the stat key stuff that Robin Locke and his family has developed especially for the bootstrapping part. So that has a standalone applet, so that's cool. We use that um, as needed as well. My other big challenge is actually getting the rest of the faculty at my university as well as the client disciplines to see the wonder of this new curriculum and actually make the switch for all of our sections of STAT 1. Um, inertia is hard to overcome, but I have given presentations here and the other faculty who have come to my presentations actually seem um, keen to give it a try. So hopefully in the near future we'll make that switch. Cool. That's that's exciting, Laura. And I know just uh, on your first point, I, I know in the past when we've given workshops and we've had or we've been in a place where we can't uh, access Wi-Fi, or at least not easily or reliably, we have been able to bundle up the, the applets that we use with the ISI curriculum. It sounds like uh, the stat key package will do the same and sort of give them in an off sort of a version that can be used offline to get around that. I mean, there's some extra hurdles because you have to sort of download a separate file but ahead of time, but um, that's, that is an option there as well. So, thanks. Um, and we'll move on to Julie. So I, I think the thing that most surprised me and that I had to slow down and, and work around was uh, that the students didn't necessarily intuitively understand how to use the applets. And uh, initially I thought if I just showed them once how to use one that they'd figure it out from then on. And that wasn't the case. So I've had to, to learn to be very careful about how to use the applets and when to use the applets. And of course other technical issues, uh, the uh, network doesn't always work and neither do projectors and other um, technology equipment. So I have to be prepared to deal with um, what if I suddenly go into class and it's uh, a lecture mode or you know, no, no technology is available for that day. Right. Super. Thanks so much, Julie. Dave, how about you? Right. So in addition to what's been mentioned earlier, I've had fewer issues with network reliability. In some cases where we had batteries that were running low, we realized that all of the outlets in the room were on the same circuit. That was a small but uh, issue we had to overcome. Also, when students use a smartphone for some of the larger data sets, it does slow down the processing time a little bit. Uh, otherwise, it's worked fine. I should also note we use a fair number of tactile simulations in the course, so there are other approaches to get at the same concepts. And um, maybe a response a little bit to Laura's working with colleagues. A year after we used it, we sponsored a workshop at our college at Trinity in Chicago, and several of the authors from the ISI text came in and helped to train not only our all of our faculty to teach the stats, but also uh, faculty from other local colleges and universities that seemed to work really well. Wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, and we. We've been privileged. Uh, we've had an NSF grant recently to be able to do a fair number of these workshops. I'll talk more about them uh, at the end of our time together today. And I'll just sort of make um, <coughs> Lacey's uh, point here, and, and since it seems like she may not be able to sort of jump in on the audio here, uh, and that is that you know Lacey was was talking about how there's less time to teach some of the formulas and reinforce different formulas used for different testing situations. And I know Lacey was was raising the point that you know on the one hand this is a more intuitive approach and sort of you, you get away from having to sort of spend as much time in some of the the formulas and and things like that. But finding that balance of you know how much formula use is appropriate and you know, um, how much would, should we still focus on some of those uh, theory-based approaches, which are in this curriculum, but then how you sort of, uh, yeah, reinforce that with students and how much time you spend on it is a bit, is a bit of a trade-off. Julie, do you want to sort of start with this last question? What will you do different next time you teach with this approach? Well, um, actually, I just started a class last week, and my hope this time is to be able to incorporate some statistical software, Minitab, in addition to the applets for the use of technology, um, 
because I, I really don't want them doing any calculations by hand if we can avoid it, but I'm also hoping that they'll get a flavor for, for what sort of software is available and how to use it. Um, we're lucky enough at Hollins to have a deal with Minitab this year where I can provide a co copy of Minitab for each student um, at least to use for a year. And so um, my hope is that I'll be able to to throw that in in addition to the other things I'm doing. I'm a little concerned about the time element, um, but uh, I'm optimistic too. Super. Thanks, Julie. We'll go on to Dave. Yeah, I should mention that I've used Minitab way back in the day and uh, SPSS. More recently, we've been using Excel since it's omnipresent on our campus. And when they get to data projects, they tend to do more work with Excel, um, but also using the applets. One structural change we're making this semester, my colleagues actually teaching the sections, is to go to a three unit um, instead of two, which is how originally um, it was presented to us at the workshop. Uh, some of the later chapters are a little heavy to do it in one single unit. And related to the data project, uh, I know that some of the authors of the textbook, the ISI book, have done two projects per semester. We traditionally have done one, and we're thinking about uh, parsing it into two smaller pieces. Super. Thanks, Dave. And uh, like I said, I think Lacey's still having some trouble hopping on, and so we'll go to Laura. Hi. I'm, I seem to be having some uh, audio problems, too. The system keeps muting me, so if I phase out, um, I'll have to unmute myself again. I'm having to constantly unmute. But anyway, I'm, I'm only teaching it the second time, so... Um, right now, I'm just focusing on fine-tuning the various activities and homework assignments I use. Um, the first time, it was kind of exhilarating, going by the seat of my pants, just kind of preparing one step ahead of the students for each class. Now I know how the flow is going, so I know how much time each thing is going to take. So I'm able to kind of, kind of tweak things and you know, know what worked, what didn't work, try to... Uh, fine-tune things uh, this time around. I'm not going to make any major changes at this point. I'm just still trying to optimize what I did last time. Wonderful. Thanks, Laura. So I, I hope that um, sort of this has gotten you, the, the listeners out there, thinking a little bit and maybe um, helped you see how these four folks have taken the plunge uh, in different ways and some of the exciting factors, some of the some of the challenges, and some of those things that they're going to keep sort of tweaking and working on. Um, we're going to have plenty of time here for questions, so if you want to start uh, thinking about those, and Camille, am I right? They're going to just kind of type those in to the sort of chat window there, and then that will come to us, and we can sort of uh, respond to those as a group. Uh, yeah, we have a couple of comments so far. Uh, Carrie Morgan said that StatKey can be used offline as a Google Chrome app, so that there's no Wi-Fi needed on that one. Okay. And uh, Michael Drake said, I teach in high school. I have an elective stats for seniors who are at best average students. We use workshop stats with Fathom and rarely do much inference. I'm concerned whether this kind of approach will work for these students. They tend to be willing to work but are not at all independent. Any if I can reply on, uh, on the yeah. latter one, please. Um, I attended a conference recently for high school teachers in Chicago, and one of the sessions I attended was a high school teacher that teaches an introductory stats course, not the AP version, and he actually uses a combination of StatKey and the ISI applets and finds that, in fact, that's a way to reach those very students. You're able to overcome some of the... Um, inertia, trying to get through different formulas, different models, and they're actually able to see how the patterns of behavior work over long term. So if anything, I think it would work even better with that audience. And I'll add that um, that would describe many of my students. And uh, one of the things I do is have them work in groups, which provides a lot of support and um, and overcome some of that lack of independence. And I found it to be a very successful switch. Uh, I was using the workshop statistics materials, which I love, but I, I think they're, they're just learning more with this approach. And maybe I'll just, this is Nathan, I might just jump in and just add, we've been looking at some, doing some assessment work and specifically looking at 
the lowest performing students. So those students who, oh, I should say lowest performing is not the greatest way to describe it. Students who come in with the weakest math background, and so, you know, uh, lowest ACT scores, um, students who just come in not knowing as much, and, and trying to specifically understand how those students do in this curriculum. And I would say, to this point, what we've seen in some of that analysis, and we're going to sort of work on continuing that and writing that up here and publishing it soon, but what we've seen is that the students are doing sort of just as well with this approach, if not better in certain areas, as with the traditional uh, intro stats kind of curriculum. I think that also speaks a bit to sort of these these weakest students, the students who sort of are maybe the most anxious and uh, yeah, in lack of independent. Maybe one thing to add to what Nathan just said, when I went to the workshop in 2013, I asked the very question, you know, how are the students that struggle, do you have them, do they still exist? And the comment that Nathan made at the time, and I've seen it to be true in my classes, is that yes, you will still have students that struggle, but the things they're struggling with are much more related to inference and topics that fit the course and less about order of operations and simplifying algebraic expressions. Yeah. Maybe before we take some more questions from the audience, let me just make a couple of quick concluding remarks, and that is that you know, certainly what we can cover here uh, today, and even as we take a little bit more time to do Q&A, uh, is, is not going to be able to answer all the questions that are out there. So we've actually um, put together a blog. I'm just going to drag that over to the screen now. It's causeweb.org slash SBI. The link was up there a moment ago. I'll put that back up in a minute. And one of the goals here is to kind of have a growing resource where some of the most common questions we've heard when we've offered workshops and throughout our discussions about these, we've sort of provided answers. And so a number of the folks who you've heard from today have posted on here and have um, responses to some of the questions that are here on the first page. How do you spend your first day of class in a setting like this? Why did you make the switch? We sort of heard some preliminary responses to that. How do you use technology? Bootstrapping, yes or no? What about projects, et cetera, et cetera? Um, there's also an associated listserv, and so if you follow through the links here under resources, um, you'll see that there's a listserv that you can sign up for. And um, the, the goal of that associated listserv is really just a place where you can sort of, you know, more or less in real time, uh, post a question, uh, send it out to a group of uh, well over 250 other uh, instructors of statistics who are thinking about simulation-based inference. Some are well along into implementation. Others are sort of sitting on the fence and haven't dipped their toe in the water yet. Um, but a place where you can ask questions uh, and, and get some responses from a variety of interested individuals. We also have workshops. Uh, our next one is going to be at the joint math meetings in Seattle. Todd Swanson, myself, and Robin Locke will be co-presenting there. Um, we have many more in the works for spring and summer 2016, and so also on that blog site, as well as through the listserv, we try to get the word out about those workshops. Um, so, uh, Camille, other questions for the, for the panel? Um, yeah, we have one from Darcy Conant who said, when diving in, about how much preparation time was involved? If I could give an initial response, I think the key is attending a one-day or, if possible, maybe a two-day uh, overview workshop that gets you to try it out yourself and to see some of the inner workings. Uh, with that, I would say the prep time isn't amazingly more than you would for a regular stats class. I mean, the nice thing about those workshops, Dave, I think is that, you know, if I was attending them as an instructor, I'd say, well, this is kind of forcing me to have, you know, 8, 12, 16 hours of focus time on this um, that, that otherwise might feel like it was more intense. Yeah. You know, our hope also is that if, if you can't attend a workshop, actually, I'll mention, uh, I didn't even put it here on the slide. We just confirmed here a couple days ago, we'll be offering an electronic workshop. Uh, two hours uh, as part of ECOTS, which is also part of the CAUSE uh, sort of family of, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, all the stuff the CAUSE does. Um, uh, next May, a uh, two-hour workshop online. There's also an archived uh, workshop that we offered at ECOTS a year and a half ago. So those are a couple of opportunities that if you're having trouble getting to one of these on-site workshops, which I think are still, as Dave said, uh, probably, you know, sort of a preferential way to sort of jump in and really focus for, for a good day, day and a half, um, that there are online resources as well. Okay, we have a few. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to jump in. I did not attend a workshop before jumping into this, and I found um, what I did is I spent the summer before um, basically working my way through Nathan's 
textbook and deciding, you know, what activities I was going to use as is, which ones I was going to modify, etc. And that seemed to do the job. And then before each class, you know, I made my slides, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's actually um, not that time consuming to prep. His book is great and really helps you along. Um, with the preparation. I have a challenge because I have the honor students, so they really don't like it if I follow the book too closely or really at all. So I had to basically get different data sets and um, go and sort of take the existing activities and twist them a little bit with different data and change the questions up because they really didn't like me following the book. So that did add a little more prep for me, but my students are different, I guess, being honor students. Yeah. So that's all. I just wanted to put my word in. Thanks, Laura. Another question, which statistical methods are the best to begin with for the introduction of bootstrapping slash SBI? And then maybe as a corollary to that, what are the inferential methods that you do cover and has that changed with the randomization-based curriculum? I can take the latter one right away and say it hasn't changed much at all. It's still one and two proportion, one and two means, chi-square, analysis of variance, and work with correlation or regression. That was a non-negotiable with my client discipline, so that's the same. And same for me. Our school doesn't cover very much in our stat one course, so I'm actually able to cover a lot more by using this curriculum. So our regular sections, they only get through the one sample inference, but now using this curriculum, I get through the two samples as well as uh, the chi-square tests. And we don't do analysis of variance until the second course, um, so I supplement things by bringing in probability, which isn't uh, part of these books generally, but I bring that in. I also bring the bootstrapping in. Um, so I'm able to get a lot more content in than I do in the regular traditional versions of STAT 1. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe jump in and, and catch part of the first part of the, the question. Um, so in terms of where to begin, um, I think that if you look at the different curricula that are out there, we've all taken a little bit of a different approach on this. Our, our particular choice in the curriculum we've developed is to start with a sing test of a single proportion. Uh, we find a, a binary variable, a single binary variable to be the, the simplest, the most straightforward stu to, for students to uh, sort of grasp. And so it's a natural place to start. And so we start looking at essentially test of significance with a single proportion right away in the course. After a little bit of sort of just very quick, like no more than a week of intro of a few sort of basic uh, concepts, um, including kind of the big picture of what our goals are in statistical uh, investigations and such. Um, as Laura alluded to, we're not doing sort of formal treatment of probability. We feel like a lot of the, the probability intuition that we're building in students about things like sampling distributions um, and other topics is built sort of through the simulations. And so we're not going to necessarily spend as much time doing a formal treatment of probability, but they're trying, we're trying to build intuition that way. Um, as, in terms of the question of bootstrapping, I think that's a really good question. Um, in our particular curriculum, this is the ISI curriculum um, that I know the best. Um, we do not explicitly sort of do bootstrapping in sort of the core course. Now, a number of folks who use the materials do choose to sort of add on bootstrapping at some point. Um, a lot of folks don't. Um, and there is a, a whole series of posts on the, the blog site, uh, which, would, which I would do sort of a poor justice to if I tried to summarize now about should we teach bootstrapping or not in the introductory course. And so if you go to the blog site, uh, causeweborg slash SBI, right on the front page you'll see a link there about should we teach bootstrapping or not. And uh, I would encourage uh, any of you who are listening who are interested to, to go there and read more about some of the pros and cons um, that we've seen. I will say that if you do bootstrapping, I, I think starting with a, a single mean uh, is a good way to go. Now we, as you'll read, if you read the post that Beth Chance and I wrote where we're advocating not to do bootstrapping, we actually advocate something a little different. Um, that's very close to bootstrapping for a single proportion, and you can read more about that on the blog. Uh, we have another question from Darcy. What's your experience with implementing this approach in courses taught by adjuncts? Are adjuncts receptive, and are they willing to come to training? I'll, I'll um, briefly mention at Trinity that was the case. Those that are teaching it in any capacity, adjunct, half-time, full-time, all went through training, and it seemed to work just fine. 
Well, here at Rowan, I'm the only one who teaches it, so until I get the rest of the regular faculty to agree to do it, um, the issue of getting adjuncts to agree is sort of not relevant yet at this point. And I, I can't really address that because I'm the only one teaching the stats at Hollands, so. This is Nathan. I'll maybe just jump in on it then and say that we have trained new people here too. And the argument I've used for a while, and I think we've sort of seen it to bear out, is that a lot of the reasons we think that this is a good thing for students, in that it's uh, easy to pick up on, it's intuitive, it's conceptual, apply to sort of new training new instructors, right? Whether that's instructors who have a PhD in statistics after their name or adjunct instructors with less credentials that way. Um, so I think in general we've heard positive things in that regard. Obviously, you know, there are ways of doing sort of trainings either by going to a workshop. I know other folks once, you know, say a lead instructor at an institution goes to a workshop, they come back and do some mini workshops with their other faculty um, or pointing them to the online resources. But in general, yes, it is different. Um, and so if these folks are used to teaching an AP statistics like STAT 101 curriculum, then yeah, there's going to be some changes. Um, but a lot of the same reasons we think it's good for our students mean that uh, new faculty jumping in, the learning curve is not as high. We have another question from John McKenzie. He says, please comment on students who have already been introduced to normal-based inference in high school. Um, I'll take it first. I have typically a few students every semester who either took stats in high school or may have even taken a more traditional version of stats prior to college. Um, initially, it's a different way of thinking for them. So they claim to have this insider knowledge, which does eventually help them. But usually after the first week, they're with the rest of us. They haven't really had many transitional problems. Okay. Uh, and I would say roughly the same thing. Initially, I might have some trouble getting students to uh, hold off on what they know about normal-based inference and and give the simulations the tr a try. But very quickly, they get in the swing of the simulations and um, have no trouble with it. And then a couple of comments. Donna Bassett said that it was a great blog and she just viewed it today. And Robin Locke wanted to point out that there are some archived cause webinars on using SBI as well. And then one more question. Any plans to develop curriculum for online teaching? Maybe, maybe I'll grab that one if that's okay. And uh, I'll also, I'm also going to jump back to your previous question, um, which I'm now forgetting. What was the previous question? Uh, uh, Comment on students who have already been introduced to normal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just say one thing we've done here at Norton is um, we've developed uh, a, a different course. We've got enough of those students now who have seen some stuff in high school that we've developed a separate track that essentially gets through um, this course, the same course, just in an acceler at an accelerated pace. Um, and so, you know, that's something to think about. I, I you know, just sort of reiterating uh, Dave and Laura, Laura's points. You know, uh, and Julie's points that, yeah, you know, those students, there's enough new with this simulation-based inference that, um, uh, you know, those students are not going to feel like this is all redundant with what they've seen before, but we've certainly seen that they can get through the material a bit faster as well, so that's something worth sort of thinking about. We've actually done that in a way so that then in a single semester, students can move through the typical STAT 101 curricula and then see some multivariable methods as well. Um, and then in terms of online teaching stuff, um, what I can say is that we've certainly seen more and more folks who are teaching SBI um, regardless of the curriculum who are doing that online. And so I think most of the curricula that are being developed are really sort of develop, developing a portfolio of uh, a portfolio. On, you know, just a portfolio of, uh, support materials to support online teaching. I can say for the ISI curriculum, you know, that includes online videos, includes a complete online homework uh, suite um, that's going to come out with the first edition here in the next couple of months uh, and things like that. I've done some online teaching with the curriculum that Chance has as well on our, on our author team and there's a number of other folks who are um, uh, using this curriculum online. All right, um, 
A couple more. Beth wants you to mention that uh, their open intro is available. Yes, yes, the open intro course. And so actually, I think if you go to the resources page uh, on the blog, I'll just drop that over here, you'll see that there are uh, some textbook resources. So I just went to the blog site, uh, clicked resources, and you'll see here we have a listing of um, a number of the uh, other curricula that are out there, and the open intro course is there as well. And I guess I, I'm not sure Beth might know better than I or someone else might, if that's particularly conducive to online teaching, if that's why you're mentioning that or just mentioning that as another curriculum option. And then one more, can you comment more on what you were finding out with regards to students who have weak backgrounds in math and problem solving in general? Yeah, I mean, so far uh, in our analysis looking at those students, um, you know, they're doing better in some areas than a typical STAT 101 course and no worse uh, in, in many and in, in the rest. And so, um, you know, what we've been seeing anecdotally, which is that, uh, you know, Dave mentioned earlier, you know, the struggles that students are having are sort of just different. There's still going to be students who struggle, but they're struggling in a different way. One little anecdote, you know, I, I remember a student who uh, came into my class uh, here a couple years ago and had gone through our sort of as remedial as you can get uh, math program for students who have a very low ACT score. And what, what amazed me was, and I kind of know who those students are coming in, and so I keep a, a particular eye on them. And, and the very, you know, first or second day of class, we were doing one of our kickoff activities. And, you know, he raised his hand and had an incredibly intuitive insight. And what was interesting is, you know, we, we've really focused in, in our particular approach on this curriculum to say, all right, let's really contextualize these problems. Let's make them real. And let's give students a chance to... Um, think about statistics in a conceptual way, in an intuitive way, in a way that's tied to sort of the problem context. And by keeping the thinking, you know, the student thinking rooted in the problem context, he was able to offer some really deep sort of statistical perspectives uh, about the study design and critiquing it. And I just felt like I, I was so encouraged by that experience because it just showed me that um, you know, by keeping things at this level, we were able to sort of avoid uh, some of the, you know, the typical problem areas for these students in terms of, you know, as Dave mentioned, you know, sort of algebraic manipulations and such that otherwise might be causing them a lot of anxiety, um, some stress, and not that we're not going to do some of that in the course, but hopefully keep students sort of in their comfort zone, um, you know, writing, thinking, conceptually, critiquing the problem, um, uh, the research question, as opposed to focusing on the math quite so much. Okay, I think that's all of the questions that we've had, and we sure appreciate everyone coming to the webinar today. This will be recorded, or has been recorded, and we'll be putting it up on the CauseWeb website. Uh, our teaching and learning webinar series is the second Tuesday of every month, so you'll be receiving uh, information about upcoming webinars through the usual channels. Thanks again to Nathan, Laurie, Lacey, Julie, and Dave for presenting with us today, and I hope you all have a nice day. Thanks so much.